and we are super delighted to introduce our speaker for this session, Dr. Jane E. Stewart. Dr. Stewart is an assistant professor at the Department of Agricultural Biology, College of Agricultural Sciences at Colorado State University, USA. Her research interests include understanding the biology, ecology, and genetics of emerging tree and plant pathogenic fungi using population genetics and genomic methods, studying the interactions of plant and fungi that govern variation in host specialization, pathogenicity, and virulence, and understanding genomic drivers of fungal species delimitation and divergence with a focus on pathogens important to Colorado's forests, shade and fruit trees and forests worldwide. Everybody, let us all welcome Dr. Jane Stewart. Thank you very much, Florent. So um, good morning, everybody. For me, I'm in Colorado, so it's actually seven o'clock at night, so it's good evening to me. But I'm gonna share my screen now. All right, so thank you so much for the introduction. Um, as Florent mentioned, my research is in forest pathology primarily. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is how we can utilize genetics and bioclimatic modeling to determine forest risk um, of different pat plant pathogens and then the threat of biodiversity from these in invasive pathogens. So um, forest diseases, uh, hopefully some of you have heard of them. If not, they're very important to our forest ecosystems because a lot of times they cause more long-term damage to forest ecosystems than all other natural disturbance agents combined. And this is really because forest pathogens can be in the soil, they can be on the leaf tissue, and they may not be very apparent until they start to cause mortality to the, the host. Um, forest diseases, especially our invasive forest diseases, will continue to increase because of increases in globalization, movement of plant materials, shipping materials, and such. And this is going to spread the number of invasive species that occur. Invasive species can dramatically change the ecosystem biodiversity and threaten the extinction of plant species. And this is because when an invasive species arrives to a new area, the host plants don't have any resistance to the pathogen. And so a lot of times they'll die fairly quickly um, because of the pathogen. So the US has had quite a few invasive pathogens and fungal pathogens that have been introduced that have really changed our forest landscape. So one example is chestnut blight that was caused by Cryphonectria parasitica. Chestnut was a really important keystone species on the East Coast of the United States. And in the introduction of chestnut blight, um, it basically wiped out chestnut in the 1900s um, from the East Coast. And because this was a keystone species, it had detrimental effects for the wildlife population and for basically the forest ecosystem. We've also had the introduction of white pine blister rust, which is an important invasive pathogen that causes mortality to five needled pines, so um, pine species. And it actually dramatically reduced the number of Western white pine by about 90% in our Western forests. And then we also have examples of sudden oak death, which is caused by phy a Phytophthora species that's impacting tan oaks in California. And then most recently, we've had the introduction of laurel wilt by, caused by Raffaella lauricula. And this causes um, mortality to uh, tree species in the lower ACA and is, was first in, introduced on the East Coast and within about 10 years is basically spread along the East Coast. So there's two invasive pathogens that I'm gonna talk about today um, that could impact the Philippines as well because they're found in, um, in tropical areas. So the first is myrtle rust caused by Austropoxenia pisidii. And we've been dealing with this because it was just recently introduced into Hawaii. And this is actually a flyover of Hawaii, Malachi Island and um, you can see the dieback that's been caused here and that's from myrtle rust. So there's been defoliation and dieback from this pathogen. And then we also have another pathogen called brown root rot disease caused, caused by Felinus noxious. And we haven't had that, that introduced into the United States yet, but I will talk about where it's been found. 
So my lab focuses on understanding the populations of fungal plant pathogens. And a lot of these are native or invasive plant pathogens. So what my lab strives to understand is how po uh, populations of plant pathogens differ in host range, virulence, climate adaptation, and geographic origin. And then how we can understand the genetic basis or the mechanism of this diversion. So why are these populations starting to spread? Um, and then I've always really found management to be an important aspect of it. So we understand the genetic basis of this, but now what can we do with it? So with a lot of forest plant pathogens, um, regulation, quarantine, eradication are key to limiting the spread of these pathogens into our ecosystems. But then sometimes we also have to do cultural, chemical, or bi biological controls. And so my lab really focuses on developing methods for this. So when we think about the emergence of, um, or the invasiveness of plant, of plant pathogens, there's four different stages that sort of occur. Um, and over time, the emergent pathogen emergence can increase. So first we'll have the stage of prevention, right? So that's our first layer of defense. Don't bring the pathogen in at all, right? Then we'll have pre-inoculation where the pathogen is dispersed, but it's not necessarily on the host that it's gonna cause infection to. And then we have early colonization where basically the pathogen has started to infect, but it's asymptomatic. So it's in the plant tissue, not necessarily causing disease um, in that early colonization. And then over time, we'll have pathogens that there's basically formed an outbreak. So you can see mortality on the tree, the pathogens are already spread and introduced. And one of the key factors in all of these different steps is early detection. So I'm gonna talk about understanding the genetic diversity of in invasive fungal pathogens, and then what we can do with that data. So what can we do to limit the spread of these different lineages of invasive plant pathogens? And this um, involves marker detection. And so in all of these stages, if we had early detection systems and molecular tools, we could eradicate it before it occurs, especially at this level of prevention. So like I mentioned, I'm gonna talk about two different stories. So one will be the brown root rot um, uh, disease, Colchlinus noxious, um, and the other one is myrtle rust, which is a, a really important invasive rust species. Okay, so Phalinus noxious is an invasive pathogen that's found in pan-tropical, subtropical areas, like in Africa, Asia, Australia, Oceania, and the Caribbean. It's an interesting pathogen because it's a forest pathogen, um, but it also can impact orchards and also in urban settings. So in areas in like Taiwan, they have planted trees that are in the urban landscape that Phalinus noxious is actually killing. And so it's a really interesting pathogen because it has a pretty diverse distribution where it can exist. Um, it causes significant disease on hoop pine, avocado, tea, and rubber. So it's economically very important, but it's also ecologically important because it has a very broad host range. So it can impact about 200 different species from 59 different families. Unfortunately, too, mortality can happen fairly quickly. So it can kill trees within up to six months and then it can survive in the dead root material as a root pathogen for over 10 years. And so it can be really damaging on sites where we find it. It also has some interesting life stages. So this is called a mycelial crust. So it's a root pathogen that comes in and then it can start to live on the lower um, stem of the tree. And then you'll get fruiting bodies that form. This is called the white margin of the fruiting body. You also see mycelial mats. Um, these are hypal zones where it's been um, basically growing together as, as hyphae or as fungal tissue. And then this is a sporocarp. Um, so this is like a conch. And this is the hymenial layer, which is basically the fruiting layer. So this is where you'll have spores that are dispersed into the landscape. So the way that um, Phalinus noxious spreads is uh, through multiple different ways. So one is through root-to-root -root contact. So a lot of our root diseases that are in the, in the ground, they will infect one tree and then they can infect the ones near it through disease centers. So you'll start to see circles of mortality 
that you can see here. So this tree was sick and then it's the fungus basically spread into these other areas. You can also get spread through transplanting new tree species, new trees, right? So you've got an infected tree here, you planted a new tree and then it starts to get impacted and um, will die. And then you, if you plant new trees into an area that has diseased tissue, so this is a, a pathogen that lives as a saprophyte too. So it can live in the root systems even after the trees are dead as a saprophyte. And if you plant new trees there, it will then start to kill the trees as well. And then another way, which we are finding is very important for this pathogen is through basidiospores. So I showed you a conch. So this is a, a basically a fruiting body here. It's um, suppressed against the resupinate, which means suppressed against the wood tissue. And this is the hymenial layer, the fruiting layer. So basically what you'll have is basidiospores that are spread when dispersed, and then they can land on a stump, germinate, and then they will infect trees nearby. So um, as we were starting to do work here, we noticed that there was a threat to the Pacific Islands from um, Felinus noxious. So we know that it can cause significant damage to native trees in the Pacific Islands, North, Northern Mariana Islands. And we've always thought it must be invasive, but how did it get there? Another reason why we think it may be invasive is because it's not yet found on the Hawaiian Islands, the Marshall Islands, Caroline Islands, Cook Islands, or on the mainland US. And so it's thought that it originated from Asia and then potentially got introduced into um, the Northern Mariana Islands in the Oceania. So there was a study done by um, Taiwanese researchers, Chung et al, that basically made about 330 collections across the island of Taiwan. And what they found was that using um, genetic markers, microsatellite markers, they found that there was a really high proportion of genotypes. So there was a lot of genetic diversity. About 98% of the individuals they sequenced were genetically unique, which is um, fairly, fairly unique for a root pathogen. And they also demonstrated on National Taiwan University, so this is on the grounds that you can see here, they basically went to every single tree on the grounds and genotyped them using genetic markers. And what they found was that instead of having one isolate that basically extended the entire region, they actually found five different genetic clusters that um, showed that the basidiospores are really the mechanism by which this pathogen spread. So each basidiospore has a unique genotype and they can see using um, different plots that these all isolates were related, these were related, these were related, and then these were two different ones, but they were closely related. And so what they um, identified was that Felinus noxious is a pathogen that has a lot of genetic change. And then there was another study done in Japan um, that basically collected samples from the Raikou Islands from here, and then also the Agasawara Islands here. And again, they used these genetic markers, which are called microsatellites, to identify um, different populations they might have um, on the islands. And so what they did was they produced a Bayesian um, structure analysis. So this is an analysis where on the x-axis, we have each of our isolates by island. And then on the y-axis, we basically have the genetic material that belongs in either population. And so what they found was that islands that are in the Raikuo group were from um, one population that was red that you can see here, but then they had a different genetic population from the Agasawara Islands that is highlighted in green. And there's very little admixture mixing of the genotypes because most of these are solid red, meaning that all the genetic material from that isolate belonged in this population. We do see a little bit of admixture, but not much. So what they concluded from this was that there was genetic differentiation and potentially introductions into the Agasawara Islands that led to this different genotype or population. So the questions that we wanted to ask um, was, does the genetic diversity of Felinus noxious in the Western Pacific region lead to geographic range differences? So researchers had been looking at individual islands or, loca or geographic locations. What we wanted to do was look at the entire 
an entire population and see if we could see genetic diversity across. And then our second question was to understand the evolutionary history. So do we see migration of Felinus noxious into different areas? And could we get to that question or an answer to that question that does, was there an invasion of Felinus noxious into the Mariana Islands? So we had a, a collection of about 95 different isolates from 12 countries. So we had from Malaysia, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan, we had both the Raikou and the Agasawara Islands, Northern Mariana Islands, Australia, and then American Samoa. We then sequenced these at four different genetic loci. Um, and these loci are used because they allow for differentiation across strains. So we had the large subunit, the internal spacer region, elongation factor one alpha, and RNA polymerase two. And these are regions that are well known and used for um, identifying uh, root pathogens pretty commonly. And then we did some analyses looking at haplotype statistics, phylogenetics, and then um, parsimony networks. So the first thing we did was produce a phylogeny. So this tells us how related the different strains are. And so what you can see is that there are three distinct um, clades or groups that we see. So here we've got one, as you can see here, that we coined the Eastern Asian group. We have another one, which I've highlighted in white, which is the Western Oceania group. And then we also have a third group, which I've highlighted in gray as the American Samoa group. So all of the isolates in the Eastern Asian group were basically from Hong Kong and Malaysia, though we do have some from Taiwan and, Jap and Japan. Isolates in the Oceania group were from Australia, the islands, and then a couple we have here from Taiwan and Japan. And then all of the American Samoa group, in the American Samoa group are all isolates from American Samoa. So it seemed pretty distinct and different. And then we also wanted to look at the amount of genetic diversity. And so this is sort of a busy table, but just focus on our haplotype diversity. When we took all the isolates combined, we had a pretty high um, haplotype diversity of 0.997. So there's a highly percent, there's a large chance that if you picked up an isolate, it would be different from all the other isolates that we have. So you could see that in total, we had really high um, diversity Eastern Asian group still really high diversity and also in the Western Oceania and the American Samoa. So basically our results were um, concurred with those from the Taiwanese group that showed that there was a lot of genetic diversity across the islands. And we do see that in our populations as well. And then we also produced a, um, a network analysis. So this allows us to understand how the different genotypes are related to each other. And so each circle here um, is a single genotype. And then the size of the circle represents how many isolates have that same genotype. And then what I've overlaid is where the isolates are from. So when you look at this circle, we've got multiple isolates that are from Hong Kong, as you can see from the yellow, um, uh, from Japan, and then also from um, Kozre, as you can see from here. So what this shows us is that using the RPB2, this is another genetic locus, we still see support for those three genetic clades. So we have our Eastern Asian clade here that makes up um, Malaysia and Hong Kong. We've got our American Samoa clade here that's pretty solid blue as American Samoa. And then we've got this Western um, Oceania group that's sort of a mix of different isolates. One thing that we can see from this um, this network is that there's some isolates from Hong Kong that group into that. So we know that there's some genetic mixing or moving of gen genotypes from different geographic regions. So the next thing we wanted to do was look at the potential climate space for these different um, genotypes or lineages that we've identified. So we used um, GPS information uh, from each of the different locations and then downloaded climate data. And we used 19 different climate variables to figure out, um, do the, is there suitable climate space for each of these different lineages different? 
And so the climate space that we had was annual uh, mean temperature, precipitation, maximum warmest month. So there were a lot, 19 different variables that we utilized. And then we did max, we did bioclimatic modeling using maximum entropy, which we call max ent. And this is a way to predict where um, these pathogens are going to be suitable. So what's the risk? Where's the risk going to happen? Um, so it works well. We use this method because it works well for limited occurrence points and also for presence only data. So basically what we found, so if you look at this A um, graph first, this is using all of our genotypes together. So the entire population that we had, we basically see that there's suitable climate space in areas where there's um, the red is high probability where that it, the pathogen would be successful at if it ended the, if it ended up there. And then the darkest green is a slight probability. So what we start to see is that um, Florida, there would be a, a good would be a good climate space for Felinus noxious. And then also areas here like in Taiwan and then in um, Eastern Australia. And then interestingly, when we only used isolates from Eastern Asia, Western Oceania, or American Samoa, what we found is that the climate space varies. And so you can see the Eastern Asia group, um, the climate space is fairly similar to the entire population. But then when we look at the Western Oceania group, the climate space starts to, to sort of explode within this, um, this region here. You can see there's a lot more red occurring. And then again, for the American Samoa group, there is um, more red in Australia and in Asia here. So there are different distributions or climate spaces that these um, potentially these genetic lineages could survive in. So we st start to see phenotypic differences across the isolates. So the conclusions from this are that we see three distinct population, Eastern Asia, o Western Oceania, and American Samoa. Um, but we do see genetic spread across the countries, especially with that Hong Kong population where we saw the, the yellow scattered within the network. Um, the American Samoa population is the most genetically distinct. However, it's the least diverse, which is really interesting because it may suggest potentially it got moved there fairly recently and is sort of diverged from the rest of the population. And then our max end analysis suggests phenotypic differences exist in climate space across these different lineages. So the next thing we wanted to look at was the evolutionary history or the migration of these Felinus noxious populations. And this work was done by a postdoc in my lab, Olga Kozar, um, who is a fantastic population geneticist. Um, so what our hypothesis was, was that there was movement from northern regions into the south, into the Mariana Islands. And one hypothesis was that it was from typhoons. So this is a graph showing typhoon movement from about 1980 to 2005. And you can see there's quite a few typhoons that have occurred in this region. A second hypothesis was that um, there was movement through wood packing materials. So this is during World War II was sort of the development of the wood pallet. And this is actually um, wood pallets being brought into the Philippines during World War II, which may suggest that there would still be movement from the north into the south, potentially. So what we wanted to do was a population genomics approach. And so we used markers called RADSEQ loci. So this is restriction site associated DNA markers. And it's basically where you take a genome and you slice it up with restriction enzymes and then se sequence, genome sequence small fragments. So instead of having an entire genome, you've got small bits of, of, um, of DNA from lots of different isolates. So to do this analysis, the first thing we needed was a genome. And so we sequenced an isolate from Ponape um, to use for our analyses for the RADSEQ. And then from all of our isolates, so it was 109 isolates that we did our um, double digest RAD sequencing. And basically we had about um, 200,000 RAD loci that were cataloged across those 109 isolates. And then when we compared them all across each other, we basically had about 7,500 RAD loci that were shared. And so it gives us a lot more strength to look at the genetic diversity and the 
um, genetics of these species or these isolates rather than using just the four loci that I had used in the previous. So we had a lot more genetic data to compare then. So the next thing we did was perform a PCA or principal component analysis using the three lineages that had been identified from the paper in 2020. And so what we found was um, we found three groups that did um, follow the, the original work. So we basically have the Eastern Asian group that's labeled in red, the Western Oceania that's in blue, and then the green American Samoa group. And so that sort of gave us confidence that, yeah, these rad loci are working. Um, let's do some further analyses on that. So this was um, using a population structure analysis, and you saw that picture from the isolates in, in Japan earlier. So we wanted to test how many populations our entire population could be divided into. So how many genetic clusters? So first we tested two, and so you can see two colors. So basically it would sep the, uh, separate the isolates into two different populations. And then we did three, four, and five. And using our, our log our likelihood log ratio, what it told us was that the best option, the best model that fits our data was five distinct populations. And so what we have here again on the x-axis is isolates and we've grouped them by, um, by country. So we have American Samoa, Australia, Saipan, Guam, Ponape, Crozeray, Yap, Palau. And then when we get to Japan, we divided those up into the different islands because we know there are different um, genetic lineages on different islands. And then we had Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Malaysia. And then remember on the, the y-axis is our population probability. So where does the genetic material from each isolate belong? Which population does it belong to? So what we see is that there's very little mixture of genetic material in the American Samoa population, the Australia, Saipan, Guam, Konepe, Kosre. But when we start to get to Yap and to Palau and to Agasawara, what we see is that a proportion of the genetic material belongs to this Guam group. A proportion of it belongs to the Taiwanese group, and then a proportion of the genetic material belongs in Australia. So we start to see that there's admixture or genetic mixing happening across the isolates. So then we um, did our principal component analysis, but then labeled everything by country. So you see that there's a pretty strong group here, Malaysia and Hong Kong. You can see the different countries um, separate out nicely besides Japan and Taiwan. And then this group sort of clusters together. So then what we're going to do is overlay the five populations that we identified from the population structure analyses onto this. And this is basically what we now identify. So we have these five different clusters and we've got some genetic material, some um, isolates that share genetic material. But if we still, if we overlay this onto a map of where those isolates were collected, so we have those five populations what you can start to see is that um, there is sort of this northern group. It's just made up of multiple of the purple and the green. Um, we have a group here that's the, the blue and the purple. So we've got some mixing from this area and then the, primarily the red. And then the bright red is that American Samoa. So remember that population is really uh, distinct from the rest. So then we wanted to do migration analyses. And this is a... a algorithm called TreeMix, where it allows us to predict how many different migration events have occurred to make up the genetic um, uh, model that we find in our data. So basically, we use the same data set. So there were about 7,500 loci. We um, had the same uh, geographic distribution where we split the isolates by country and then also the Japanese isolates into islands. And then we tested, are there one to 20 different migration events? What's the best model for our data? And the program will run until the migration events add about 99.8% of the, the vicariant, so the variance that we might see. So um, what is the best model that explains the amount of genetic variation that we see? So what we identified was that there were four migration events that best described the 50% um, of the vicariance or the variance that we see, but then there were 12 migration events that best describe 
And so I'm gonna list these 12 out. So one thing we can look at is um, who was the sink or who, who was the source and where was the sink? So basically this is a, it's called the tree mix plot. And what we can say is that we had genetic material that came from the ancestor of Hong Kong and Malaysia that was brought over to American Samoa. And the darker the color, the um, higher percentage of material that was transferred. So the, the strongest ties that we have here, I've, I've taken all of this information and put it into a table so that it's a little easier to see. But basically what we had is the, we had movement of material from Malaysia, Hong Kong into American Samoa. We've had movement between the Japanese islands. We've had movement from Kozari and Ponape into Australia and American Samoa. And then we've had, uh, we've had uh, genetic material move from Malaysia, Hong Kong into Taiwan. And so what I've done is I've taken this information and now I've put it back on the map. So it'll be a little bit easier to read, but just know that the percentages vary a little bit of how much material has been moved around. So what you can see from this, um, so let's look first at our hypothesis was that basically we've got movement from the north into the south. And we do see some evidence of that. So we've got genetic material from Malaysia, Hong Kong that moves down to American Samoa. Um, and then we've got some material, genetic material that moves from the Pacific Islands or the Mariana Islands into Australia. But we also have evidence for uh, migration to the north. So from the south to the north. So American Samoa into this region in Japan here into the islands. And then we also have movement within regions you can see from the, the green um, arrows and then also from the black arrows. So the, the history, the genetic history of this um, pathogen is much more complicated than we had originally thought. We thought we would basically see movement in and that these, the pathogen was fairly recently introduced into Mariana Islands, but we don't see a lot of evidence for that. So um, what we find overall is that the genetic history of this pathogen is a lot more complicated because we've got gene flow in both directions. So we've got from the South Pacific um, to the Mariana Islands and vice versa, Mariana Islands into Japan, um, Western Asia to Japan and to the Mariana Islands. And so the one model that may fit this migration is typhoons may be the main carrier because you could have typhoons in both directions, but I don't think it's the movement of wood um, pallets during World War II. But the next step to really tease that apart is to determine the timing of these different migration events. So timing is key, which we're still doing um, analyses for. So overall, what we found is that um, there are different genetic lineages that represent putative phenotypic differences. So each genetic lineage poses a threat, a distinct invasive threat. So just because you have Colinus noxious, if you got a different genotype or genetic lineage introduced, it could behave differently on the landscape. Um, but further studies need to be done to elucidate, to elucidate uh, differences in host range virulence and environmental uh, requirements. We know now that this is a pathogen that has a very complex evolutionary history. Um, and we know by, there was research done by Shashi et al um, that showed that Felinus noxious, though it's known as a host for, um, for broad leafed species, we do know that it can imp impact and kill Japanese temperate conifer species. And so it's, it impacts both gymnosperms and their angiosperms. And so it's a very invasive uh, risk to the United States and to lots of other countries where we have climates that are more mild. Okay, so the next story I'm gonna talk about is myrtle rust. Um, this is a pathogen that has caused a lot of havoc in, in quite a few countries and is starting to spread around the world um, pretty quickly. This is, as you can see from the, the slide, is a collaborative project from folks from Hawaii, from Brazil, um, Australia, and New Zealand. And this was funded by the USDA Forest Service. 
So Australopithecinia basidii, or myrtle rust, is an emerging forest disease. It's a biotrophic fungus, which means that it can't live off of its host. Um, it infects young, actively growing foliage, buds, um, and then it impacts the hosts are from the Myrtaceaceae family. Unfortunately, it's got this really unusually wide host range, so it impacts about 450 different um, host species from 33 genera, which is pretty rare. Most fungal pathogens are host specific, um, but this is one that impacts a really large number. The symptoms you can see here in this um, figure here, so they're brown lesions with masses of yellow orange, these are called uridinia spores that, that um, are able to be wind disseminated and move fairly quickly. You can get uh, the plants that are impacted have either decreased growth or loss of apical dominance, or it causes mortality, which I'll talk about as well. Um, it's native to South and Central America, we think, but we're not sure. And here's just a list of all the different, some of the, the genera that this um, pathogen is able to infect. So unfortunately, um, much of the, many of the species that this pathogen infects are dominant components of forest ecosystems in Oceania, Southeast Asia, South and Central America, and Southern Africa. Um, one of the species are eucalyptus, um, which in Australia, there's about 700 species that are native there. And it's also a genus, as many of you know, that are widely planted around the world. So when these outbreaks happen, and you can see the, the defoliation and mortality that's occurred, um, this is detrimental to our forest ecosystems because there's a change in structure, composition, and function of these forests. So this is a pathogen that has the potential to cause devastating impacts in different ecosystems. And this is also um, a plant species that's very important to Hawaii called Ohia, which I'll talk about. So Ohia is a endemic um, plant species to Hawaii. Um, it's really important because it's got a lot of cultural significance and it occurs on about 80% of Hawaii's nat native forest on many of the different islands in Hawaii. And it also provides food and shelter for native birds. And so this is a species that um, yeah, uh, locals do not wanna lose because it's vitally important to the ecosystem, but also to their culture as well. There's also a, um, a devastating story of native guava in Australia. So um, myrtle rust was introduced to Australia in 2002. And since it's been introduced, it's basically threatening the native guava into extinction. So here you can see um, wide swaths of the forest, swaths of the forest that are basically been killed off by the pathogen. And what, what researchers are really worried about is if you have this native tree species um, gone, it's gonna alter the ecosystem function. And so there's many different species in Australia and New Zealand that are at risk of extinction because of this pathogen. So just to give you a brief history of, um, of myrtle rust. So it was first introduced in, uh, on, in, it was first identified in Brazil on guava in 1884. You can see here. It then spread to um, rose apple and eucalypt in Brazil, but then also spread to Puerto Rico, to um, Colombia and to Jamaica within like a 50 year period. And you can see that there's multiple um, uh, host species identified here. So this rose apple got infected, but it didn't infect the guava, which gave some um, a semblance that there might be some genetic divergence within isolates. And then in the 1970s, it spread to eucalypt plantations in Brazil, allspice in Florida and the USA. And then within the probably the last 20 years, it spread to many locations, Hawaii, Mexico, China, Indonesia, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand are pretty recent introductions, um, Japan and rose apple. So it's spread fairly quickly over the last um, 20 years or so since its uh, last, um, since its introduction into like Florida. So the question that we had was very similar to that of Flinus noxious. So basically, using a global population or a, a large number of isolates um, 
what are the genetic similarities and differences among, among Australopixinia that we find on the diverse number of hosts in these different areas. So, you know, it's found, Australopixinia is found in North and South America, on Hawaii, South Africa, Asia, and also in Australia and um, New Zealand. So is, does this represent one strain, one genotype, or are there multiple genotypes? So the, the study that we did focused on primarily um, North and Central America and then Brazil and Uruguay. And then we also did again that bioclimatic modeling to try and understand if there are differences, um, will they behave differently or do they have different suitable climate space? So we basically had um, 226 isolates that had been collected from these locations. Um, they were collected from six different countries, locations, and then they represented um, 28 different hosts, as you can see here. And what we found using these microsatellite loci, so these are the, the same loci that the Japanese and the Taiwanese um, groups had used to differentiate um, Polinus noxious. We basically found that there were different populations. So here's a Bayesian uh, structure plot, which you guys hopefully recognize now, because I showed it a couple times. Um, so here we've got North and Central America and South America. And remember that each uh, each row or each column represents genetic diversity or the, the population structure. So basically what we found was that in this area in North and Central America, we have three genetic clusters. So you can see the red, the green and the purple. And then in South America, there was more genetic diversity, which was um, primarily in Brazil, where we have six different genetic clusters. You can see here and here. And there's one genetic cluster that was found in Uruguay, and it's also found in North America as well. So then we also produced a minimum spanning network, um, which again allows us to look at how these different genotypes are related to each other. So remember, a circle represents a single genotype. The size represents how many isolates are in that, um, that have that same genotype. And I've also got that number here, if you're interested. And then I've also color coded it by genetic cluster that we identified using the Bayesian structure analyses. And then here's the locations they were found from. So this is Hawaii, Costa Rica, Puerto Rico, and Jamaica. Um, so then we also were able to overlay different biotypes that have been identified. So from this structure analysis, what we found was that there's three different biotypes. Um, and the biotypes have different ge diversity, genetic diversity, but also different host ranges and geographic areas. So the first biotype that we've identified is the pandemic biotype. And we call it pandemic because it's the most diverse in locations found around the world, but also it has the greatest um, host range as well. And it encompassed C, uh, genetic cluster one and genetic cluster four. We also have another biotype, which we call the guava Brazilian biotype. And as the, the name suggests, it's only found in Brazil thus far on guava. And um, interestingly, this is a single genotype that makes up 65 different isolates. Then we also had a third biotype, um, which is the uh, eucalypt rose apple biotype. And you can see that it makes up um, five different genotypes, makes up that biotype. And then there was a study that came out by Granitos et al. that found that um, there was a, a, a fourth biotype called the South African biotype that's genetically distinct from the pandemic biotype. So interestingly, over um, the past 10 years or so, the pandemic biotype has shown up in Australia, Indonesia, Colombia, New Zealand, and Singapore. So this is a pathogen that is spreading fairly rapidly. And then when we did our bioclimatic modeling, like we did for Austro for, um, for Philinus noxious, basically what we found is that the different biotypes do have different climate spaces. So this is looking at all the, the genotypes combined and then this is the pandemic, B is pandemic, C is rose apple eucalypt, and D is the guava biotype. And what you can see is that um, the climate space varies and these pose different risks to different locations because of the differences in the climate space. 
So one threat to Hawaii is the rose apple eucalypt biotype. And so there was a study done by Silva et al. in 2014 that tested pathogenicity of the eucalypt rose apple biotype onto Ohia. And what they found that it was pathogenic. And interesting, what we see too, is that in our climate space modeling, so this is Hawaii here, we do see that there's climate space where if, the, if this biotype were to be introduced, it could um, successfully colonize and cause havoc. And then there have been other studies that have looked at the eucalypt rose biotype on Australian host, where they found that this, is, this biotype is pathogenic to native Australian species. And then if you look at our um, climatic modeling, there is suitable climate space in Australia and New Zealand as well for this eucalypt rose apple biotype. And then just recently in 2020, um, a, gr a group from South Africa tested and New Zealand tested the South African biotype on four different native New Zealand Mertaceae species. And what they found is that it was pathogenic. And so what this represents is that there's a risk that if, if these species, if these different biotypes were to be introduced, there could, could be a threat. So this was um, defoliation and mortality that was observed on Molokai in Hawaii. So um, basically forest health monitors had done a flyover over Malachi, and what they found was that there was defoliation happening. And they knew that this was happening because of myrtle rust or Australopithecinia pisidii, but they didn't know if it was a new biotype or is it weather related. And so one thing that my lab has been focused on, um, and Jorge Ibarra has been focused on this, was developing lamp markers. So lamp um, markers are genetic tools that allow us to um, distinguish different biotypes from each other. And the first thing we need to, to, to develop these are genomes because we need to find genetic regions that are unique to each of the biotypes and different from each other. And then from that, you develop a molecular marker that we can test. And that the nice thing about these LAMP markers is that you can do this in the field. So basically you take your primers that you've developed that are unique to that biotype, add a commercial master mix, and then add DNA of your sample and then you'll get a color metric change. So basically this would, a pink would tell us that there were negative reactions so that there's no DNA of that biotype, whereas the yellow means that there would be a positive reaction. And so um, we've actually designed, Jorge's actually designed some of these assays. So here's one for the pandemic biotype and here's one for the South African. And um, collaborators had given us DNA from different regions with so the pandemic, South African, eucalypt, um, for these from are from Brazil. And basically what we found is that pandemic assay is effective because it's positive for the pandemic DNA, which is off of Bohia, and number five, which is from Brazil, but it's negative for all the other ones. And then when we look at the South African assay, um, it's negative for all other DNAs except for the South African. So this gives us some promise that these tools are working and we can actually use these in the field. And so this was something that we've actually developed for white pine blister rust. So basically you take your ready-made um, tubes that have the primers and the, the mix and everything, and then you can um, take small samples. This is some pustules from the rust or from the leaf tissue. And basically using a heat block from your car you can extract DNA and then heat up the samples and you can get either a positive or a negative right in the field uh, within about an hour. So it's a pretty cool technique to, to utilize. So in summary, what we find is that Australopixinia is an invasive rust that does have multiple genetic clusters. Um, the pandemic is probably the most um, widespread because it's found in more device, diverse hosts and geographic regions. Um, <coughs> excuse me, we do see that each of these biotypes have a different ecological um, behavior um, in terms of hosts and suitable climate space, and that um, understanding where these biotypes exist is really important for tracking pathogen spread, developing regulatory measures, and, and implementing strategies. Um, just a couple more slides. So one thing that's really cool about this research is that 
Hawaii just implemented rules for um, limiting the importation of plants from the myrtle family because they don't want that second biotype, the eucalypt rose apple, introduced. So there's just May of uh, 2020, there are new restrictions to try and prevent new invasive species, these different biotypes from coming in. So overall, from this presentation, I hope that you guys got that um, the diversity within fungal invasive fungal pathogen populations could lead to multiple genotypes that might represent new forest health risks and potentially um, losses in biodiversity. Understanding this diversity is crucial to developing management tools like these detection assays um, for minimizing the risk. And this allows uh, forest managers to be informed of the potential forest health risks because of the, the um, emerging issues with uh, basically species going extinct because of these pathogens. Okay, with that, I'd like to thank members of my lab, um, Jorge and Olga, Jessa, and then some key collaborators, Misut Kim, Ned Kloppenstein, and Phil Cannon. So, and this is obviously very collaborative work. These are all the, the folks that um, we've worked with to get this research uh, accomplished. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks. All right, thank you, Mom Jane, for that uh, very comprehensive presentation. Uh, we are inviting our audience to put out their questions in the chat box, so you could ask uh, Dr. Jane Stewart. Okay, for the meantime, uh, we have a question here from Ms. Dr. Jennifer Niem. Um, this question is for the benefit, uh, benefit of our student audiences. Um, what are the biological consequences of genetic diversity? And why is it, uh, why is it, uh, uh, why is this uh, biodiversity uh, important among fungi? So I hope that I shared that um, they may act differently, right? So if we have this genetic diversity that occurs on the landscape, these different strains may behave differently um, when they get introduced. So especially for these invasive pathogens, they may have different climate spaces, right? That allows some of them to be more aggressive on the landscape, whereas others may be so not. And so understanding um, how genetics and the phenotypes sort of coexist is really important. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, a question from uh, Ms. Nieves Capilli. Uh, what specific time frame, uh, what specific time reference do you use for the evolutionary development or migration of these fungal pathogens, the ones that you have discussed? How would you proceed to assigning a time reference point to support the hypothesis on evolutionary migration of uh, P. noxious? That is an excellent question and it's really tricky. So we've got to find some time point where we know that um, either separation occurred or movement occurred. And right now, that's one of the stages that we're at in the research is figuring out what's that time point that we can reference all the other ones on. Um, historically, when I've looked at evolution of fungi, you can do it um, based on researchers that identify when evolution has happened ac across different clades. But for this one, it's a little bit tricky because we'd have to be able to time point when movement may have happened. So we were hoping World War II would be one time point because it's obvious when that occurred. Um, but I think these events happened much earlier than that. And so we're still working through that. Okay, follow-up questions. Were there any genomic studies before those points in time suggested for the, which suggested for the migration history of B. noxious? No, so this has really been the first study that's looked at a large number of isolates across this geographic region. So there have been studies that have looked at genomic studies that have looked at the Taiwanese isolates and the Japanese isolates, but not across this range. So another question, obviously the introduction of the myrtle rust in Australia is a case of exotic species dominating the endemic population of a uh, fungal species there. So uh, what measures are being taken to assuage the, the situation? So um, they are trying to eradicate and detect these other biotypes. So it's spread far enough in Australia that eradication probably won't be possible. And they'll probably have to go in and do planting of non-host species. 
but now they're also very concerned about the South African strain and also the eucalypt rose apple strain getting introduced. So that's really, it's through the regulatory actions that they're really focused on. So the outbreak in New Zealand was fairly recent because it was in 2017 and they are trying to do eradication. So basically removing all the plants that they know that are infected. But unfortunately, this is a pathogen that spreads through the wind. And so eradication is really hard because the dispersal of it is, is fairly far reaching. So another question, how much of a threat are these two pathogens that you have the discuss the Pinoxius and the ACDI in the Philippines. Uh, can you recommend any mitigation, uh, mitigating measures to prevent or minimize the damage? Um, I think both of these are a, uh, are a big threat to the Philippines. Um, there's been some hypothesis that it's present in the Philippines. And uh, the student, one student that I work with, Jessa Atta, um, she's actually faculty in Los Baños. She will actually come back after she finishes her PhD. And I hope she will start to work on those. I think for Australopixinia obsidii, um, using these molecular diagnostic tools is a really good regulatory measure and also limiting the import of invasive uh, plant species that are host would be a good regulatory method. A question from uh, Mr. Roden, Carlo Lizardo, um, what could be, the contribution of the population diversity study of Pinoxius in the Philippines in the hypothesis of its movement in the Asia Pacific region. Um, so which, which genotype do I think exists there? Is that the question kind of? Uh, I'll read it again. What could be the contribu contribution of the, of the population diversity study of Pinoxius in the Philippines? Uh, for the, for the hypothesis of its movement in Asia, in the Asia Pacific region. I hope, so, I have- yeah, So I, I think, have, yeah, I think what would happen is likely, well, it depends because the isolates from the Philippines could come down from Malaysia and Hong Kong, or they could be from the Mariana Islands. And so, um, yeah, I guess it's basically where is it moved from? I don't know what the significance would be right now, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, the climate spaces did vary for those different uh, groups, genetic lineages. Any more questions from our group, from our audience? Okay, um, I have a question here. Based on your experience work, working with probably various models for fungi, aside from MaxEnt, uh, which among the past and novel models you know, can accept relatively small sample size, but still provide excellent uh, predictive power. So for the uh, bi bioclimatic modeling? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so the only one I've actually worked with is the Maxent, but it, mm -hmm. it does a fantastic job. And I know a lot of researchers who use that modeling tool as well. Mm -hmm. But you haven't come across uh, or use other uh, models for your studies? Modeling? No, yeah. okay. no, just that one, yeah. So for uh, my question is, um, uh, how important is the role of natural history museums in documenting these pathogenic fungi or uh, any other species to ensure better prediction of current and probable distribution of these species under the changing climatic scenarios? Very important because what you can do is if, if that pathogen has been collected before, um, you can actually use museum samples and get DNA out of it. So you can look at genetic change over time. You can look at when it was first introduced. Um, so it's basically a resource for researchers. And we use them when we're studying uh, fungi, actually herbarium specim specimens from museums are crucial mm -hmm. to the lot of work that we do. Uh, from Dr. Niem, um, her question is for the origin and distribution of a species, which is more important, the center of origin or the center of diversity? Usually they're the same. So typically um, the center of origin is going to have more diversity in that area because it's got a e longer evolutionary history. And so usually we predict that um, yeah, the center of origin has the greatest diversity. If you're looking at a fungal pathogen and you want resistance against that fungal pathogen in a host, you typically go to the center of origin 
so that you find, you expect because the host and the pathogen have evolved together, there will be resistance. So um, follow up question for me. On a macro level, what is your suggestion for a country like the Philippines, uh, which we provide disparate uh, sources of environmental data? Uh, sometimes we, you know, these data are, are even inaccessible at all to the public. So you've mentioned that you're, you're, you've used the 19, 19 data okay, variables. Climate variables so, climate, yeah. uh, so probably here in the Philippines, we won't get that, uh, that many because uh, our sources are you know, from several yeah, agencies. More scattered. And yeah, yeah sometimes so, you can get it though from PRISM um, databases like I'm not sure what the coverage is in the Philippines mm -hmm. um, exactly, but yeah, I guess we would get what we could from that from that region, and hopefully we could set up a study. We had funding to set up a study where we'd actually put out sensors and things like that as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, these predictive models can suggest probability of wide species distribution in the future. Uh, yeah. But however, several factors like deforestation, land use change, um, yeah. urbanization, which are currently happening on most of the you know, uh, suitable habitats for these uh, fungal pathogens, yeah. it could actually drastically affect the, the species uh, distribution. So um, can these models that you've discussed earlier, can they easily adjust their predictions if we have data like uh, you know the rates of changes for deforestation land use urbanization and such yeah so you can actually do predictive modeling for the future as well so you can change the parameters to let's say you um, there's for deforestation that happens the landscape's going to change right and if you can predict how much hotter it might get how much drier it might get different aspects of what that factor is caused on the landscape you can pr use predictions that way yeah I mean, they're yeah. all predictive, though, right? So it's based on the data that you have. Yeah. Yes. And um, uh, I've managed to check the GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information mm. Facility, and you you can actually see in this uh, the report, this 2021 report, that uh, the fungal occurrences are just around for the Philippines around. 15,600, that's fairly small. Okay, yeah, it's and, fairly small, yeah. And there are just mostly sac fungi and the basidiomycetes. Okay. And the active publishers just concentrate mostly on the you know larger organisms, the flora and the fauna. Um, although we have new data publishers uh, led by our Biodiversity Management Bureau, uh, you can still see that the USA, <laughs> US-based US um, uh, universities, they are still the largest contributor of data sets for the Philippines. Wow, yeah. So on a research collaboration standpoint, uh, what what is your opinion to at least make sure that more data on economically significant pathogenic fungi, the, such as the ones that you have studied, are more available for sound decision making and for control in the future? Um, I think there's collaborations and then um, educating students that then go back and are able to do that. So one thing is that I, I do have a, a student in my lab who is a faculty right at, in Los Banos at the University of Philippines Los Banos. And I hope that she will come back with the tools that she's gained and be able to do those kind of studies. I mean, part of the trick is getting the funding to do the work. So there may be collaborations that can happen through the US if funding isn't available, um, but you need basically resources and education, right? You need people on the ground who can do the work and then also the funding to support that. So through collaborations and through training, I think that's um, the best mechanism, right? Yeah, and I think uh, there should be you know, put more emphasis or importance in, you know, uh, for museums to collect also um, yeah. not not only the the macro fungi but also the the ones that are uh, less showy eco yeah, less showy yeah. <laughs> <laughs> economically yeah. significant especially if they cause uh, diseases and uh, yeah like uh, they hamper crops and uh, probably alter the landscape just like what you have uh, I think uh, another thing earlier. you can do is use public awareness 
-hmm. A lot of forest pathogens in the United States have actually been caught by, first observed by citizens that have nothing to do with this. It's just that there's been enough public awareness and pamphlets put out. And mm -hmm. so the public knows, okay, this is, I'm, I'm worried about this. This is what I need to look for. And then setting up databases or a location they can send samples. So using the public as well, I think is, is really important to capturing because we can't go to everywhere, right? Yeah. And these forest diseases could be anywhere in the forest landscape. So using, basically broadening your net and doing citizen science is really important. Yeah, especially, you know, if these uh, pathogenic fungi, uh, you know, there's, there's a time that they, they start en encroaching on, uh, like, um, from the forest, they go to the, to the fields to, yeah. to start in, uh, investing uh, ag you know, uh, crops, cereals, like, like that, you know, when yeah. they transfer. Totally. And they could be found in the urban landscape too. You know, if you have large trees planted. Okay. And things like that. Especially now that, uh, you know, I think the, the concentration is not on forest fungal pathogens. Yeah, more, yeah. <laughs> more on agro agronomic crops, you know, yeah. because uh, that's the ones that they think they are Unfortunately, more important. Unfortunately, though, they can be right. devastating. Right. These, yeah. Right. So any more questions from our audience? before we wrap up and before we end our program, let me just um, uh, get our virtual certificate of recognition. <laughs> we will award this for to Dr. Jane Stewart. Thank you. All right. So um, the Museum of Natural History, uh, UP Los Banos, College Laguna, we are giving this certificate of recognition to Dr. Jane E. Stewart for serving as a resource person during our MNH Biodiversity Seminar entitled Where Genetics Meets Bioclimat Bioclimatic Modeling, Determining Forest Health Risk and Loss of Biodiversity from Invasive Forest Fungal Pathogens held today, March 23, 2021, from 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Philippine Standard Time via Zoom. So in witness whereof, the signature of the director is affixed, Dr. Marian P. De Leon. 